Latte, congratulations on your new film, uh, Freedom's Path. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love watching these uh, period films, um, you know, especially during the Civil War period. It's, it's just something about uh, those type of films that, you know, historically, it's it's all about storytelling. But tell us where the original idea came from um, for, for you. Sure. Yeah. So for me, I just I love history um, like you, you know, period stories, films, um, love them. When I was six years old, I actually saw Disney's version of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain with Elijah Wood in it. And at six, I was just in love with it, the idea of adventure and being on the Mississippi. But when I was a little bit older, I, I kind of realized the emotional connection and draw I had to it. You know, Huck being this arrogant, ignorant kid wanting to go off on an adventure and Jim being a grown man running away, getting away from slavery, trying to get to his family and then having to Jim having to kind of deal with Huck and kind of teach him along the way was very, a very powerful resonating thing with me and films like glory and different things really resonated. And so um, wanting to tell a story about humanity and not so much about social or political things, but about people really at, at the most fundamental basic level and also flip a classic narrative that I had seen being that oftentimes it was a white character in some capacity helping an African-American character. I wanted to flip that and also represent the over 250,000 free African-Americans that lived during this time in the South during the Civil War that I'd never seen depicted. I didn't learn about that. And I thought that was so powerful to think in this country and nation built and predicated on freedom and liberty. You know, it, a certain subset of group of people are denied that freedom and liberty you know, who would want it more? And and let, what would their story be, especially individuals who were free? How are they fighting? What were they, what did their lives look like? And so that was, I guess, those are some of the elements that really, really inspired and, and pushed me and motivated me to make this. Well, let, let me address uh, first, uh, I, I did get a sense of the Mark Twain, uh, you know, type, type of storyline, but of, of the friendship between them, um, who is it, William and Kitch. Um, um tell tell us about that and how you wanted to cast uh you know two 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 young two young gentlemen who uh per perfectly to uh, portray that friendship. Yeah, great question. Um so yeah, the leads uh, for William and Kitch were going to be so important because it's it, it, it's a it's a it's a drama and there there's a lot of heavy stuff but there it's it's very nuanced in the relationship and so finding the right individuals to be able to bring these characters to life was huge and so the search for us was uh was significant. We really, we really went wanting to find the right people. And RJ, RJ Kyler, who plays Kitsch, um, the second I saw him, um, just jumped out. And it was, you know, he had he had that it factor, this just raw natural ability to make you feel something. And and Garen Howell is a, a London-based actor, also brilliant. When I saw his read, it was just like there's William and, and to have to have those moments we actually for this film it's it's a little scary because in an independent film you know we don't have some huge budget to do a bunch of you know uh test screening and and and, and uh working through with the actors before shoot so they met really about one time before being on set for the first day and uh and their chemistry it just it actually got so so amazing and so they got so close that that we were always having to check ourselves like wait wait wait, wait. You guys are way too friendly in this scene. Like, pull it back, pull it back. We gotta, we gotta work through it a little bit. So it would, um, both as individuals and as actors and and as the characters, they they exceeded my my greatest expectation. They they're just phenomenal people. Now, one of the biggest reasons uh, why we don't have a lot of Civil War period movies is because of budgeting. And you know, this this is a this is an independent movie. A heck, you know, I I I love like uh, when Ted Turner tried to make Civil War movies, but that almost bankrupted him. So, how did you pull it off? <laughs> With sheer luck and stupidity, um, no, we we uh, it was it was from the from the outset, right? Like this is as indie as it gets. You know, I, I found the financing myself through uh, spending two and a half years emailing people. I sent out over four thousand emails um, and and found our investors that, that way and um, find found people that believed in it. We we didn't have nearly enough money that we needed, so we took you know we had to just stretch every dollar. And and the, one of the biggest things that happened was every single person on this product project um, in front of the camera, behind the camera, they really, it became their project. It, you know, my dream was no longer my dream. It was our dream and they really put added to it. And so I think that really starts shining through um, in terms of just, I would say a overall broad spectrum of things. Like everyone gave everything, everyone sacrificed for it. Everyone, you know, 
I would say that that to start and then you know some some basic things right so like we knew how if we wanted to make it look good we're going to rely on natural lighting as much as possible it's also going to save in the budget to not have to have huge lighting packages so we're but it was also going to really push us because we were chasing daylight all the time um we worked with uh, civil war reenactors so people who had all of their own gear cannons horses wagons guns everything so that adds production value that we didn't have to go out and actually pay for but it was it was a combination of just everyone's absolute passion and 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 love for the story and their craft putting into it and then just being being as uh, as gritty and indie and 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 also make trying to make it look as big as we possibly could so it was it was a, it was a it was a, a tough effort but we i think we we did it well, I ha I have I have to give credit to you. I mean the uh, the the Civil War battle it it did look like a big um, budget production. I, it must have been the way how you filmed it and placed uh, all the reenactors uh, on on that battlefield. Thank you. Yeah, it was that was that was the stressful. We we saved the Civil War battle scenes for the very end because we were thinking, okay, we can build into it. It's going to be the biggest cast and crew with all the soldiers, and we were we were anticipating having about four times as many soldiers as we were as we had. We ended up having about between 60 and 70 soldiers in total for both sides. And luckily, a lot of these reenactors have uniforms for both sides, so we had to get very creative, keep it very tight. A lot of smoke and haze and fog and and big loud sounds and and so to hear you say that that means a lot so thank you now tell us about your research into the underground railroad i mean uh you know it's it's it was a secretive organization and then the only thing that uh you know like we learn in high school history that it's just it's just like a path for you know sl slaves trying to travel to the north uh, for, for freedom so tell tell us how you generate a story with this Absolutely. So one of the first things I did is I, I came across something called the Federal Writers Project. And it's like the greatest secret that no one knows about. It's an open source. It's open source. And it's it's a, a government. It's through the um, the um, the Library of Congress. And in the 1930s and 40s, the government sent out um, a couple hundred interviewers into the South and the Southeast to interview the last living generation of individuals who lived under the bondage of slavery. And what's amazing about this is that the individuals that they were interviewing at the time of the interview, they were all incredibly, some of them are as old as 107 years old. And so at the time of the Civil War ending, when slavery was officially done and over with, these individuals were 30, 35 years old. They did live a lifetime. They weren't like two years old. And so you really have all these experiences and accounts. And what's incredible is these interviewers, they they uh, when they recorded the interviews, they actually recorded them phonetically. So they didn't change anything for proper English. So you get accent, you get, you get flow of language. And then there's actually some audio recordings. And so they break this down by state um, and, and location and area. And so going through these resources and the actual historical record of hearing the voice of these people and I think pulling as much as possible from real lived experience and immersing immersing ourselves in that process of wanting to to give something that is incredibly authentic and that that represents right the hopes and dreams and the lives of these individuals so we actually incorporated small elements of actual stories into into the uh, into the film from the Federal Writers Project from these interviews that these individuals gave. So that was that was a huge huge resource. And then Ken Burns, you know, things like Civil War documentaries and things like this, just really kind of leaning in and, and just finding what is that authentic story for these individuals. Of course, you know, you you had a your the area that you filmed them um, seemed to be very nondescript because it, it could have taken place uh, anywhere. Uh, tell tell us where you actually filmed uh, this project. Fantastic question. We shot this in Northwest Arkansas, kind of at the base of the Ozarks. And um, one of the things that I knew going in is people who love history films are looking to tear them apart. And so we wanted to be very nondescript. We didn't want to tell you a day or an exact place or a time. We wanted it to feel it could be anywhere. And the thing that was exciting for us about Arkansas was often when you see films in this era, it's it's their Spanish moss and swamps and the classic Georgia, Louisiana, South Carolina kind of feel. And Arkansas is a true Southern state. It was, it was a, a Confederate state, but actually contested. But to show us um, a film in this era with, with maybe a little bit different geography than people are used to, let them kind of, it, it breathes a little bit of a new life and character into it. So that was really exciting to lean into the character of Arkansas and the visuals that it provides that, that again, were different than a lot of films that you may see with um, you know, antebellum or Civil War era films. 
did you have to build a cabin or did you find it? We did. We did. We, uh, our pre-production cause budget was, was tight. We, um, we, we built the cabin. We only had about two and a half weeks to build it. Our team was incredible. I mean, and what's amazing, I've got to shout out to our production designer who's in, in charge of building all of the, the physical stuff and designing it is she bought in so much that everything, everything was authentic. So the wood, the way it was cut, it was cut on the only circular saw that would have you been used to cut wood like this. Um, it's the oldest, oldest thing in the Southeast. And she cut it on that saw. Um, the hinges on the door were from, you know, the 19th century, 1830s and 40s. I mean, it was the nails that were used. Everything was was authentic. So when you're in it, it's just like, you, you, even even how she would, if it, it was raining all the time, it was wet. And she wouldn't use, she would use period ways of drying things. So lots of cinnamon and different things on the ground. And so it, you're in it and you just feel like you're you're transported back. So it was it was a, amazing to have something like that to, to be able to be a part of it and in. Well, I, I could tell one one thing is that you you certainly did not um, build the plantation house. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't have that budget. We did not have that budget. No, that was that was uh, Arkansas is an interesting state because it actually a lot of a lot of things were destroyed um, around around the time of the Civil War and um, and it was also a contested state. So you had a lot of the homes are actually just after that period. So that was one of the very few homes that was built like in 18 in the 18 late 1860s uh early 70s i believe so right after the civil war and and found that and um we're able to use that but yeah we, we weren't building that one there's no chance <laughs> now um you know to 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 round out your uh, your film the uh the adversaries the villains i mean these guys are vicious uh tell tell about tell us about uh, the you know crafting uh you know the villains of of, of your story yeah, thank you. Good question. Again, that, that was probably the hardest thing, you know, in, in when you're writing something and, and conceiving something and writing something as like a slave catcher or a patty roller, you know, you and Bremner plays our slave catcher Silas and he does a brilliant job. But, you know, going going into the psyche of these individuals and, um, you know, trying to find trying to find those characters it's depressing. You know, I spent weeks just being depressed, like you having to you go slog through this and, and get through it. But, um, and they were hard to shoot, you know, going into those scenes, we knew, you know, you kind of anticipate going into some of these th scenes and how heavy they were going to be. Um, but it was amazing to be able to work with incredible people who like you and is this humble, sweet, amazing guy. And he was able to turn it on and be something very different, but it adds, it adds a significant um, somber nature to the film um, and gravity to the film when you're shooting it. And I think appreciation for what individuals fought through and persevered through. Um, and, uh, and so it was a, a hard but a necessary element to, to show and represent in, in film. Now the, the tunes and the songs um, in this film, are they actually, uh, you know, historical or, or did you have to come up with something new? Love the question. I'm so passionate about this. So um, yes, 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 yes. They're all authentic. So the Macintosh County Shouters is a group that is credited by the Smithsonian. They're a family that have passed this, um, these songs, these uh, shouts, they're called uh, down generation from generation. They're part of the Gullah Geechee culture. And, and it was, it was believed believe that this form of song and dance, this combination of song and dance was extinct and gone, that it was lost. And this family was discovered preserving it. And they have over 20 original songs. And I saw them doing a performance years and years ago for the Library of Congress. And I like, I hadn't, I didn't know them. I, didn't know them. I was like, they have to be in the film. They have to be in the film. And so not only are the songs authentic and original to the era, but but we incorporated them into the score as well. So there's a lot of guttural humming and tonal voices that that's the shouters as well, bringing that authenticity. We we had some, we tried to bring in some singers to see if they could sing some old spirituals and things, but it just didn't sound right. And we knew it was never going to work. So we brought the shouters back in for the, for the score. So we're very, very excited about that authenticity. And there's one song also I'll say that was kind of a serendipitous, beautiful moment is Carol Sutton, uh, who plays the role of Caddy, um, our adoptive mother to Kitsch, and ultimately William in the film, she um, she gave just an incredible performance, but there's a scene where she sings a song and it's at a really pivotal emotional moment in the film. It was not scripted. And, and we talked to Carol, we knew we wanted to get some stuff of just kind of floating around and filming with her. And I said to her, you know, on set one day, I said, Carol, do you know any songs? 
um, that we could sing. It could be anything. And and she's thinking, and I was like, especially this era, she was, I don't. And she literally just snapped and goes, you know, Brett, there's one song I know. And she goes, but I don't know all the words, but my grandma sang it to me. And it's a railroad song. It's from those, that era. And I just like goosebumps go off. And so we start, we said, okay, I'd never heard it. We just start rolling and we start filming and she starts singing it and just raw emotion comes out. And, and we had kind of talked about the context because in this wasn't a scripted scene. And so we said, Hey, Carol, think about this happening. And I don't want to spoil anything, but think about something happening. And the, it, it was honestly one of the most beautiful moments I've ever been a part of in film because just the emotion, the tears, everything. And it was so raw and authentic. So even, even some of the songs that we never even planned for or were aware of that kind of were serendipitously brought in, which is a, a really exciting thing to share. So the music I'm so passionate about, thank you for asking that question, but yes, authentic. <laughs> Both are excellent. Well, let, let me wrap it up with one, one last question, Brad, because, uh, well, you know what? I think it, you know, the entire interview says it best uh, because this is your feature film directorial debut. And I was going to ask, like, how was that overall experience? And it's, uh, your your enthusiasm it sounds like it was a terrific experience. <laughs> it was it was amazing. It was hard. It was brutal. You know, I think anytime it took me over 12 years to do, you know, to get done and, and it really chasing it the whole way. And so I would say it taught me, you know, for anyone out there chasing a dream, whatever their dream is, however far off it feels like just it's going to be harder than you imagine it to be. You're going to have more obstacles in your way than you ever imagined that there would be at the outset of it. There's going to be pitfalls and everything in between, but, but it's worth it. And if you keep at it, you can absolutely accomplish anything you set your mind to. And uh, you'll, the, 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 the journey truly is far greater than the destination of it. It's, it's the, the magic of, I think life and that's life. And so I, that's the thing I learned most and absolutely loved every minute of it, even though, it was brutal and hard and I hated a lot of it. It was also the greatest, as I, especially as I look back, all the hard moments were some of the greatest ones as well. So then what's up next? Working on a, a period World War II film, but not not war. It's actually about the kids who are left at home as their dads are off fighting. It's kind of a stand by me meets dead poet society and and uh, working on that one. And then my big next one is is uh, this film Neverland. It's the short film I did. It's a uh, it's a film about an inner city uh, foster child who has nothing but himself and his daydreams. And he imagines himself as one of Peter Pan's lost boys, but Neverland is not whimsical. It's very naturalistic and very excited about that one as well. So we're, it may be 40 years before I get it done, you know, in my rate, how I work. So, you know, we'll see, but those are what I'm working on right now. Well, you know what, it's, it's a pleasure uh, carrying this conversation with you. Uh, I, I love your enthusiasm and you, you, uh, you basically create very good storytelling into your films on, on, on indie budget. And, and I, and we love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.